Praise the Lord. Uh, would you turn to your neighbors and just greet? Lord is here and Lord is coming back soon. If you could just turn to your neighbors. <clears throat> Before I begin, I would like to welcome uh, CTS Korea, as we've been announcing. Uh, this is a Korean Christian television um, ministry that we work closely, and it's, it's really good kingdom ministry. And uh, the team flew in from Korea a couple days ago. So can we uh, just welcome them? Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> Amen. But I do ask you to um, listen carefully today because I don't want you to be distracted with this topic. Uh, and the title of the message, if you could just look at it, it's, Therefore, You Must Be Ready. Therefore, You Must Be Ready. Uh, that's a statement, and that's a st strong statement. There are... Uh, in the Gospels, there are several strong statements like that, and I would like to introduce uh, them to you so that you could get it, okay? He doesn't say you must uh, go to this school. You must, you know, eat this. But he does say things like, I'm going to introduce four of them. Son of man must be lifted up. The cross. Absolutely. The Son of Man must be lifted up, Jesus said in the Gospels. The second must is you must be born again. That's a must category. If you're not born again, you will not see the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said. You will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And third uh, is you must follow me, John chapter 21. That's a must category. So discipleship is not something you learn and kind of like uh, train in a class, but it's a lifetime thing, following him, okay? And then today, the fourth and last one uh, that I would like to introduce is you must be ready, okay? You know we're talking about uh, this whole topic of the end. I, didn't, I was just contemplating whether to share this or not, but our Snoopy, our dog, passed away this week after 18 years. And I thought, wow, that would not really affect me. But <laughs> I cannot help but to think about it. Scripture speaks about the end. It's a pretty amazing topic if you think about it. But here's what I want you to think about. If he speaks about the end in a way that he uh, spoke in the, uh, the Sermon on the Mountain of Olives, can we brush it off? Can we just kind of like dispose it? Can you take it partially? I don't think so. you got to be a fool if you do that. People talk about relevant message. What is relevancy? What is relevant to your life? And we need to talk about family. We need to talk about raising children. We need to talk about, like, you know, things like that. That's relevant. What about this message? You don't think this message is relevant? Unless Jesus is kidding. Think about it, people. Okay? Michael Green, a uh, Bible commentator, uh, wrote in the commentary to uh, Matthew. He, he wrote, The purpose of prophecy is not to give us history written in the future tense, but like a film, preview, or trailer, and hazard warning lights on a highway to lift our hearts in expectation and in warning. Can I just ask you, why would Jesus talk about the end the way he talked about it? Can I just ask you, why would he do that? Because he loves the disciples. Imagine you do not know this truth, but this comes, so what is it going to be like? It's going to be like an accident. How many, of, how many people 
drive on a highway thinking that they will get into an accident. Nobody does. People know there is a possibility, slim possibility, but how many people know the accident is actually coming in five minutes or 10 minutes or sometime before I get to the final destination? Nobody does. Accidents always come suddenly, right? And that's how it's going to be. Imagine G Jesus did not explain this to you, and then you just have to one day, you know, just like an accident, Jesus came. What's going to happen to you? That would be disastrous, wouldn't it? A lot of people will face it like that. But Jesus spoke about this topic because I believe his love, right? It's very stern. It's very uh, almost uh, scary. And yet, it's got to be his love, right? So teaching and the prophecy of Matthew 24 and 25 deals with the topic, a grand one, that no one can dispose or put it aside if there is any possibility that this is true or the truth. Remember we talked about the truth? Truth is based upon reality and facts. You look up dictionary, Google it, truth. It is based upon reality and true facts. If not, how can you call that truth? Does that make any sense, right? And I know you're sensing it. Uh, Jesus and Christianity is the truth. Jesus claims that he's the truth. Scripture is the truth. Otherwise, what are we doing here? What do we study the Bible? What do we listen to it? It's all garbage. If he talked about the end and has been telling the people for the last 2,000 years and people listen to it, some, of, some people listen to it and even give their lives for it, and if that's not true, he, he's got to be the greatest scam in history, human history. Greatest lie, garbage, wicked manipulation, and you're wasting your time, we should get out of here. However, if it is true, if it is true, you cannot just brush it off. You cannot partially pick out whatever you want to pick out. You've got to be a fool if you do that. It doesn't make any sense, but rather it demands your all. I just want to make that clear. It demands your all, all or nothing, okay? Well, <clears throat> in this crucial teaching, Jesus, who's on his way to the cross in a matter of just a few days, whether this teaching was on Wednesday night or Thursday night, people debate. But nevertheless, we know Jesus went to the cross on Friday. So it's just a few hours before his death. So could you feel that? He's not kidding around. He's really, really serious. And he answers these two key questions by his beloved disciples. These are the two questions. And I've been reminding you uh, every single time. The first question is, when will this be? When? When? Is it going to be year 2023? Is it going to be 2050? Or is it going to be tomorrow? When is it? So the first thing is the uh, when question. And the second question the disciples asked was, what are the signs? What are the signs? Two incredibly important questions. And Jesus uh, answers those at a very, very critical time of his ministry. He answers the second question first, and then the first, and I'm just going to give you a summary, and there's going to be distinctive signs. And we've been talking about this, some more distinctive than others, some more obvious than others, but there is going to be signs. Jesus is loving enough to share that with us so that we don't have to get into an accident completely not knowing, right? So what are, what are some sign of the end of the age or the return of Christ historically? Many false prophets, many uh, false Christ, false teachers, false prophets, false gospels, and false Christians, and they will fall away. Okay, I'm not going to explain any further, and I think it speaks for itself. Secondly, wars and rumors of wars with 
Much natural disasters like flood, famine, and fire, tsunamis, typhoon, pandemic, and worldwide inflation, all these things may be the signs, okay? Thirdly, he spoke about the suffering and the persecution of Christians, not prosperity. He talked about sufferings and persecutions of Christians. You know, the, uh, the fathers will hand over the children, and the wife will hand over the uh, husband. It's always the wife, right? So suffering and persecution of Christians. However, in the midst of all of these, the kingdom of the gospel of Christ will spread all over the, all over the, all over the nations. God is not shrinking because of all these uh, disasters and, and animosities and, and all of these. His kingdom is going forth and the gospel is going forth through the faithful servants of God. Okay? And then there are more hidden signs in the chapter, which I'm not going to talk about it in detail because I, I don't think it's uh, necessary for us, including, uh, including the fig tree. Remember the, uh, in verse 32 and 36, it speaks about the, uh, the fig tree, which represents in the scripture the nation or ethnic nation of Israel. And did you know that after Israel fell as a nation in AD 70, in 1948, almost 1,300 years later, the nation was restated? Did you know that history? How is that possible? Think about it, people. A nation that fell 1,300 years ago and actually uh, was uh, restored, including the resurgence of the Jews, which happened miraculously, or I call it sovereignly, in 1948, after so many years of, uh, you know, after so many years. But here's the thing that Jesus is saying. Listen carefully. This repeated uh, statement is, you will have signs, they are very, very significant, but it's not going to be distinctive. That's the wisdom of God, and that's the love of God. If you could figure out, oh, Jesus must be coming tomorrow, we, uh, with our wisdom and wickedness, we will use it and abuse it. And Jesus knew, right? God knows that, so he basically said, there's going to be signs, there's going to be distinctive signs, there's going to be clear signs, but the, the day and the hour, no one knows. Could you think about that dynamic? It's a pretty amazing dynamic. In other words, he could be returning anytime, and that's absolutely true, and there's a clear signs, but you do not know. Okay? So that's the, uh, that's the situation. Uh, the second question, when will this be, the, which was the first question, when is the end, when is the return of Christ? Jesus repeatedly say, the day and the hour, no one knows. If, if someone say he's coming back in 1992, there was a huge historic uh, you know, thing in 1992. Anybody born in 1992? Don't raise your hand. Yeah. Jesus returned and you, never, you were never born. Those are all lies. The Bible clearly says no one knows. Could you think about that? You know, uh, I'm thinking about if that is true, we need to be married in light of that truth. If that is true, we need to go to school in light of that truth. Do you agree? If that is true, you need to look at your career and making money in light of that truth. If that is true, you need to look at sufferings in light of that truth. If that is true, we need to do ministry in light of that truth. Do you agree? If that's true, right? So basically, we don't know the hour, so it'll be sudden, like an accident. It'll be sudden, people. Get this, it'll be sudden. You won't be able to figure it out. Everyone will be surprised. And it will be unexpected, like the thief in the night. And it will be unmistakable, the most public uh, history, historical event in human history. 
No one will miss it. Okay, that's what the scripture states. So today, in light of this seemingly unsolvable, intriguing, yet life-shaking, unavoidable truth that the Lord teaches, what are we to do? What, what are you going to do? The truth of the matter is, most of you will not pay attention. That's exactly what Jesus said. It'll be like the day of Noah. Most of you are not going to even pay attention. As soon as you walk out, it'll be a history. One ear, uh, ear in, one ear out. That's what Jesus is saying. Are you listening? So what are we to do? Jesus uh, and the scripture gives two exhortations, just simply two. One is, therefore, stay awake. Stay, aw stay awake. Be alert. And the second one is the title of the message today, therefore, you must be ready. Those two exhortations, and both of them begins with the word, therefore. In other words, Jesus explains, and therefore, stay awake. And, and then Jesus explains, and therefore, you must be ready. Okay? So let me explain, <clears throat> what are we to do in light of this great truth of Christ returning? And you will be stand before him, every single one of us. No, I'm not. I don't believe it. Yes, you will. Either scripture is true or you're right. Okay? Think about that, people. So the first exhortation is to stay awake for you do not know what day or when the Lord is coming. And here Jesus is giving an analogy. So like a movie trailer. Could you, could you picture that? I don't know what other recent exciting movie is. I recently saw Once Upon a Time in America, Robert De Niro. 40, 30 years ago. Great movie. We see a trailer. We see bits and pieces, but we do not see the whole thing. But Jesus is basically giving an analogy and, and preview what will happen when he returns. And here is the expression. Okay, let's look at uh, today's text. But concerning that hour and the day, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Okay? For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. That's the key statement. When Christ returns, it'll be like the day of Noah. What was the day of Noah like? Here's, uh, here's the description. In those days, verse 38, before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day Noah Enter the ark. In other words, until everything finished, people were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving into marriage. Could you think about that? Could you think about that? Until door is shut, all people cared about was eating, drinking, marrying, and giving into marriage. Temporal things. That's foolish, isn't it? Okay? Verse 39, and they were unaware until flood came. I don't know whether you knew, uh, Pakistan, one-third of the land is in the, uh, underwater right now. You could Google it. You could see it. One-third of the land is underwater right now. But when Noah's day, the whole world was under the water. No one survived. No one survived. Okay, that's what he's describing. They were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. So Jesus' uh, expression is pretty, pretty, pretty dark. But he's reminding you. He's giving you the picture. And that's what's going to happen to you. When he returns, it'll be like the day of Noah. Until door is shut, until... It is too late. You'll be eating, drinking, marrying, making money, try to buy a house, go on a vacation, all these temporal things. Okay? This week, I uh, took a little bit of time and tried to look at what that Noah, days of Noah, looked like in the Old Testament. That's what we need to look at, it, right? Genesis chapter 6 speaks about the flood and the ark. Here is my question. God, who is the creator, who is the, who is the father, 
who is the who is the beginning of all things and he created men according to his image and he loved the people and yet what caused him to swept them away like that with flood he's a long suffering god right he's loving god what caused him how bad was it here's the description are you ready for this okay Genesis 6, 5, this is what Scripture des uh, describes what the days of Noah is like. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great. Can I just pause? Lord sees you. And the wickedness of man was great. That's what he sees. How great. It was so great in the earth that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Did you catch that? This is ESV. I mean, this is a strong statement. Let me read that one more time. Lord saw human beings, and the wickedness of man was great in his eyes, in the earth, and the every intention, everything you try to do, every intention of the thoughts of his heart, your heart, was only evil continually do you catch it is scripture exaggerating that's how god sees how people human beings are and my question to you and i was are we better right now are you better okay next verse so lord what's his response and the lord regretted can you believe that he regretted he regretted that he created men. He regretted that he had made men on the earth, and he grieved. He actually grieved okay, to his heart. That's his response. You think, you know, God has no emotion? God is a passionate God. God grieves over your wickedness. God grieves of your stubbornness. God grieves of your unbelief. God grieves, regrets. So what does, uh, what does the Lord decide to do? Verse 7, so the Lord said, this is what I'm going to do, I will blot out men with whom I have created from the face of the earth, men, animals, and creeping things, and birds of the heaven, for I am sorry. He's actually sorry. The word sorry and regret is the same word in, 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 in the original word. Naham, which means he grieves and he's sorry and he regrets that he created you. Before the judgment comes, that's how he feels. Are you listening, people? Because Jesus said, you're not going to be listening. Noah preached for 120 years, but nobody listened. Can you believe that? I've been preaching here for 13 years. Are you listening? Seriously. Jesus said, it'll be like the day of Noah. Ah, yeah, okay, I get it. And then you go right back to your life. Right? And then, all of a sudden, the next verse says, but Noah found favor, grace, in the eyes of the if you're sitting here that God has given you grace, that's the context of grace. I don't think we could possibly say, what about them? God, you are not, you're such a not loving God because you saved me, but not them. I don't think you could say that. I don't think you're in a place to say that. I don't think you are even being reasonable to say that. Do you understand that? When God sees you, the way he sees is that the wickedness of men was great in the earth and every intention of the thoughts of your heart. Your heart, people. Your heart. Was only evil. Continually. You know the doctrine of total depravity in uh, Romans chapter 3? You know that doctrine? That's the basis of the gospel, people. Your wickedness is great. That's why he grieves and he regrets. Naham! And he's sorry that he created you. He is. Because you're stubborn. 
Do you listen to him? Do you repent? You're so stubborn. Okay? The wickedness of man was great. How great? Every, only, continually, totally. Okay? Lord's response, he regretted, and he's, he's sorry that he, he bore you. You know, like some fathers said, I regret that I bore him. Can you imagine God doing that, right? Naham, be grieved. So what, what did he decide to do? I'm going to have to wipe out the humanity. But let me just tell you something. What was the ark about then? What was the ark? There was a grace and salvation available. Did you know that? How evident was it? He's been preaching for 120 years. 120 years! How long have you been going to church? And then there is a visual sign of the ark, size of a football field, on the top of the mountain, mountain of Ar uh, Ararat. Right? There is that sign, and you do not believe. You continue to eat, drink, and getting married, and giving into marriage. That's, that's, that's humanity. That's you. That's me. I got to make more money. Doesn't matter what it doesn't matter what, what it takes, but I gotta make money. Usually manipulating others. Right? Usually. Think about it. This is a, this is the situation. The point of this day of Noah comparison illustration is the comparison. Similarity. That's how bad it was. And when Lord when the Lord returns, that's how you're gonna. Can I just ask you to think about this? Are we better than day of Noah? You think we are better than day of Noah? You think we are more humble than day of Noah? We think we are more spiritual than day of Noah? I tell you something, unless the Spirit of God really make you born again, you will never be changed. Unless God gives you a new heart. Okay? So, It'll be like, uh, that was like a trailer or a preview. Because wickedness of man, God regretted and sorry, but the day and the hour, no one knows. But could you think about that? Did no one know that the rain will come? While he was building it, the rain couldn't come, obviously, right? I, I think that much he knew. But when he completed the ark, he knew now, do you catch that? That's why the Lord gives signs to his disciples. If you truly love him and truly follow him. So what's Jesus' exhortation? Therefore, stay awake. Because it'll be like the day of Noah. Stay awake. Gregope. That's a really a, in, important word. And for those of you who've, who's been coming out to New Heart for many years, I use that word many times. Because where, did you hear, where, where do you hear that word? In the mountain of Gethsemane. When Jesus was a few hours before he go to the cross, he asked actually disciples, Gregope. That's only a day, one day later. Chapter 24 and chapter 26 is right there. Do you think Jesus meant it? Absolutely. So let me explain what that word means. Gregope, stay awake. Be alert. Don't fall asleep. Okay. The next chapter when Jesus is in Gethsemane, a night before the cross, would you imagine that? Jesus is ready to go to the cross, and he's ready to be crucified, and he picked three best members of the congregation. Peter, James, and John. I don't know who, whom I would personally pick, but he picked best members of the congregation. His heart was sorrowful and troubled to death. Could you picture that? Do you pay attention to other people's pain? I'm really asking you. Do you pay attention to other people's pain? Jesus was sorrowful and troubled to death. So he picks out his best disciples, Peter, James, and John, and went to the mountain of Olives, Gethsemane. I've been there, actually. And then he says, you remain here 
and watch with me. Did you catch that? This is so insightful. You stay here and you stay awake with me. You know what stay awake means? You are with Jesus. What kind of Jesus? A Jesus who is sorrowful and troubled because he's, he's taking up his cross. Insightful, isn't it? You know, I was really meditating about this. What does it mean to stay awake? Oh, yeah, that means we need to pray. But no one prays. Not because they don't know how important prayer is, but because they don't want to pray. People don't pray because they don't want to pray. That's the conclusion I come to. Nobody really loves to pray and really know the importance of prayer and not pray. No one does that. We don't pray because we don't want to pray. Right? So it's not the mechanic of prayer. It can't be. Jesus taking his best disciples, closest disciples, I should say, Peter, James, and John, and asking, you know, I'm so troubled. I'm so hurting. So sorrowful and troubled. Can you stay awake with me? Okay? And he went away and prayed. <laughs> and then he came back. What, what, what were they doing? They were sleeping. Can I just ask you, do you pray with the New Heart Mission Church? I really want to ask you. Not to corner you. Do you pray with New Heart Mission Church? So he came back and the disciples were sleeping and Jesus and came and saw Peter and watch this. So can you not watch or stay awake with me for an hour? Can you not Grego pay with me for an hour? Okay. So stay away, Grego pay, and pray that you may not enter into temptation. What's temptation? Jesus prayed in the mountain of Gethsemane, not my will, but thy will. Temptation is not thy will, but my will. In other words, temptation means you're living whatever the kind of life you live. You don't care about God's, God's will. You don't, you, don't, you, don't, you, don't wanna, you don't wanna know. But stay awake it, with Christ, taking up the cross with Jesus for the salvific work of his kingdom. And when Christ returns, how would you feel then? You will be welcoming him. I think that's what Jesus meant. Okay. The second ex ex exhortation is similar. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day the Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had not known in what part of the night the thief was coming. Jesus is coming like a thief, people. What does thief do when they come? They take away your leftover food, right? No. They take away what you value the most. Everything will be taken away when he returns. Right? So when the master, if the master of the house had not known what part of the night the thief was coming, he would be stay away. He would have stay awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Okay? In 1 Thessalonians, Paul said, that was Jesus, Paul said, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Paul said that. Okay? 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. Peter said, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with, an, uh, with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up, dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. So Peter said that. In Revelation chapter 3, John says to a church at Sardis, which was a huge church, mega church, but dead. That's, that's exactly how the, that is described. There are big churches that are dead in the Bible. Okay, And John said, Jesus said, remember then 
what you received and heard and keep it and repent. Repent. Repent, people. If you do not wake up and repent, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour and I will come against you. Do you hear it? And I know you're not going to listen. A lot of people are not going to listen. You'll just scoff. You'll just laugh. Okay, so Peter, Paul, and John, and Jesus, and the entire New Testament uses this description of the thief in the night, and he's going to come at an hour you do not expect, which means suddenly, which means quietly, which means when you are least expected. And Jesus is telling us that. Okay? I just want to close. I know this is a difficult message. And I know we need to hear hopeful message. Gospel is hopeful. But hope in light of the final separation and judgment, people. Do you have that? Seriously, do you have that? What kind of hope do you want? False hope? Fake hope? Pseudo hope? Oh, one day I'll make six digit, seven digit figure salary. That's your hope? He will come like a thief in the night, people. One of the most difficult things about this whole teaching of judgment is the separation. I told you the word krinos has the root meaning of separation. Jesus constantly talks about the separation. Here, here's what he talks about. After he talks about Noah, verse 40, then two men, start with two men, will be in the field. One will be taken and the other one left. Could you picture that? Two men. I'm sorry. One will be taken. One will be left. Okay? And then two women. Two women will be grinding at the meal. One will be taken and one will be left. The thing about judgment is separation, people. Separation. Jesus talks about separation and judgment. In light of that, there is the cross. The cross of Christ. Don't you see it? It doesn't make any sense to talk about cross, and you can't without talking about the end and the judgment. It doesn't make any sense. And do you remember what happened at the cross? Separation took place. Judgment took place. My God, my God, why are you forsaking me? Eloi, Eloi, laba sabachthani. What happened to Jesus? He was separated from God who was one for eternity. Why? Because he was judged. The whole wrath of God came upon him. Why? For you, for you, if you would truly put your life in it and to follow him. Right? So final thought, the Lord's exhortation in light of this, his return and imminent coming of the end, just two. Stay awake. Are you awake? Stay awake with me. Are you participating in his suffering? You know that verse in Philippians, which, we, which is what we will be going into? I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his suffering to become like him. Retaining and gaining the resurrection somehow. Fellowship of sharing in his suffering. What is that? Stay awake. Stay awake. Participate. Taking, taking up my cross and be part of his kingdom salvific work. Is that what your life is about? Okay? I just want to close. What would happen if you don't? What would happen if you don't pay attention to Jesus' word? And he already explained it and I'm going to remind you and then I'll, I'll be done for today, okay? What would happen if you don't pay attention to Jesus' word 
According to Jesus, it'll be like the day of Noah, and the flood will come, and you will be swept away. Period. You will be swept away. Don't worry about your wife. Don't worry about your child. Don't worry about your parents. There's going to be separation. You won't be able to hold on to someone's hand and go together. You won't be able to. Don't worry about which church you go to. Just, just because you, you go to New Heart Mission Church, no, you're not safe. No. Just because you go to uh, Calvary Chapel, no, you're not safe. It is your faith. It is your relationship. Right? Flood came, swept them all away. So will be the coming of Son of Man. Secondly, what's going to happen? There's going to be a big separation. Two men will be in the field. Two people in the church. One will be taken. One will be left. There's going to be two women in the grinding uh, at the mill. They'll, they have the same profession. They look the same in our eyes. But one will be taken. One will be, one will be left. Okay? There's going to be a separation which is the root meaning of Krinos, judgment. And Jesus' scripture, Jesus and or scripture, continues to speak about this separation judgment. One will be taken, one will be left. The sheep will be on the right, and the goats on the left. Wheat into the barns, and tares to be burned. And wise virgins in, and the foolish ones, the door will be shut. This is the word of the Lord, people. And it'll become like a thief in the night. And, and I meditate about this. What does thief take when he breaks it into my house? He's going to take my leftover food. No, he's not going to do that. He's going to search and look for the most valuable things of my life, and he's going to take it away. And Jesus will take away everything you treasured. It's going to be gone, people. Gone. And then I thought about this verse, what Jesus said. What good is it, O oh man, that you gain the whole world and lose your soul? He's going to take your soul like a thief in the night. This is the third week. I'm sharing this message, and I'm really thinking about if this is true, you cannot brush it off. You're a fool if you do that. But Jesus said, many of you will do. Many of you will do. Like the day of Noah. I just want to close with the two final verses of the chapter. Okay? There is a story of a master and trusting his property to his servants. Uh, that's like, that happens often in, in the Gospels. And he goes on, a, uh, goes on a journey. And he returns. What does he do when he returns with his servants? He settled account with you. Judgment. That's the story of Matthew 24. And I, I want to give you as a sneak preview of how this chapter ends. Master of the servant will come on a day when he does not expect him at an hour he does not know. And he will cut him in pieces And put him with the hypocrites, religious people who are not true Christians. What's going to happen there? In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I want to finish with the same question. Why did Jesus speak this to, to his disciples? Because he's mean? Because he just has no emotion? Because he loves his disciples. This is coming. Therefore, you must be ready. That's what Jesus wanted to tell his beloved disciples. Let's pray.